Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Today we are going to have a look at a paper that recently came out uh, in Annals of Surgery, a multicenter randomized control trial comparing safety, efficacy and cost effectiveness of the surgeries anal fistula plug versus surgeon's preference for the transphenteric fistula in ANO, uh, aka the FIAT trial. Following that, uh, Professor Sababala Subramanian will give us an overview of the differences between superiority, non inferiority, and equivalence trials. This will complement our previous sessions on randomized clinical trials, you can find them on our website or on our podcast channels. Stay tuned for more. Um, my name is Emily. I'm one of the SHOs at Huddersfield Royal Infirmary um, and I'm here with my colleague Mr Gio Perrin who um, is one of my senior um, staff members. Um, we're going to be going through the FIAT trial which is a multi-centre randomised control trial comparing safety, efficacy and cost effectiveness of the surgicis anal fistula plug versus surgeon's preference for transphincteric fistula in ANO. Um, it was published in Annals of Surgery um, and that was this year. Um, and I think Gio is going to start with some background for us. Yeah, of course. So um, as we all know, uh, fistula in ANO is a very common clinical problem. Uh, we will encounter one or two uh, pretty much in every surgical take. Uh, Transphincteric fistulae uh, can be a little bit of a problem. Uh, they're difficult to treat uh, in comparison to lower fistulae. And a variety of treatment options have been described in the literature and beyond, uh, such as fistulotomies, cutting setons, advancement flaps, and ligation of uh, intersphincteric fistula uh, tract. Um, they all have different degrees of uh, healing, uh, and uh, we do know that there is a change in continence associated with having these procedures. So in this context, uh, a few uh, years ago, um, a fistula plug, uh, which is made basically of porcine collagen, uh, has been introduced in the market. Um, and as you can see from the diagram, the way it's inserted is basically it goes and plugs the fistula tract. It's positioned in place and is supposed to let it heal. Um, originally, reports were very encouraging with very, very good results. And uh, as time went on and more publications came out, uh, success rates in terms of healing of the fistula have been um, sort of in the range between 35% and 87%. And we don't have too much data concerning the risk of incontinence associated with, it, with the use of this device. So uh, hopefully this paper will cast some light on, um, on this particular problem. Uh, Bob, back to you. Okay, so I'm going to talk through uh, some of the aims. So the trial was designed to compare the fistula plug versus the other surgical techniques that uh, Gio has just mentioned, um, with the primary outcome uh, being faecal incontinence quality of life. Um, so very quickly, the population would be uh, over 18 years old uh, with a clinical diagnosis of transphincteric fistula. Um, the uh, intervention would be uh, the biodesign surgicis plug. Uh, the comparison would be with surgeon's preference i.e. preference of whichever surgical technique, um, and then the outcome, again, being the uh, faecal incontinence quality of life. Back so a few notes about their methodology. Um, as mentioned, this is a multi-center randomized clinical trial, which has been conducted in a group of DGHs and teaching hospitals throughout the UK. Uh, two arms involved are uh, the biodesign surgicis plug versus surgeon's preference, and any of the techniques that you can see between the two brackets could be used by the surgeon. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one ratio between the two arms, and uh, randomization was minimized for age, ASA grade, type of surgery planned, 
and the presence or absence of extension of uh, fistula. And we'll go into inclusion and exclusion criteria a little bit more uh, in a second. No blocks were employed for randomization, and this is a completely open level uh, trial. So there is no attempt at blinding uh, either participants, surgeons, or um, data collectors or assessors. Uh, Bob, back to you. Okay, so very quickly, the inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, as we've already said, they're going to be 18 years older and above, and they're uh, going to have a clinical diagnosis of uh, fistula um, at examination under anesthesia. Um, they had to have an MRI performed six months prior to the randomization. Um, the fistula itself could have uh, only a single internal opening um, and uh, attract at least two centimetres in length. Um, and they had to have been treated with a draining seat on for a minimum of six weeks before randomization. Equally, to uh, exclude participants, um, they were excluding anyone with more than one internal fistula opening. So um, anyone with multiple openings or secondary tracts, uh, those, those were allowed. Um, clinical or radiological evidence of active infection if they'd previously been treated with a fistula plug, um, the, they could have had a previous surgical intervention, any of the other surgical interventions, but they can have previously had this plug. Um, and uh, if they had a cultural or re religious objection to the use of pig tissue or uh, an absolute contraindication to MRI, um, as the MRI needed to be performed six months prior to randomization. Uh, brief uh, diagram of the outcomes that were measured. So we've already talked about the faecal incontinence quality of life, which was a uh, 29 MCQ questionnaire with four domains, which they measured um, at baseline, uh, and then again at six weeks, six months, and 12 months. In terms of uh, secondary outcome measures, um, at baseline, they did a generic quality of life questionnaire, uh, which you can see up there. Um, and then they did um, post-op complications and re-interventions immediately post-op. Um, and then at six weeks, six months and 12 months, they then also did fistula healing, uh, re-intervention rates, complication rates, generic quality of life again, and some marks in continent score. Um, and then at 12 months, they also measured cost effectiveness as well. So let's start having a look at uh, the results. Um, as you can see, 1,355 patients were assessed for eligibility and 304 were randomised uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion in two groups. And as you can see, the two groups are uh, pretty much perfectly balanced um, between each other. Um, they have overall an excellent retention rate. So uh, at 12 months, they still got 142 patients uh, in both arms. So results of quality of life on time and results of healing on time are pretty strong for this for this um, randomized clinical trial. Um, interestingly, um, we mentioned in inclusion criteria that all patients must have had an MRI within six months of randomization. Um, that's true. However, the results of the MRI do not actually make up the inclusion criteria. So about 10% of patients in the fistula plug group and 10% of patients in the surgeon's preference group actually did not have a transphenteric fistula at MRI. They did have it at the EUA that originally diagnosed them with a the fistula. And we'll talk about it later in a bit more details. Also, their original um, sort of expected um, number of patients recruited uh, was uh, 500, which was reduced to 300 uh, because of slow recruitment. Um, Ball, back to you. So, um, again, looking at the primary outcome. So, the main thing uh, to take away from this table is that essentially um, the p value is greater than 0 0.05 in every single domain. So, that means that when comparing the uh, fistula plug and the surgeon's pre preference in every single domain, um, there was no statistical significance, and that was at every uh, single uh, time as well. Um, also, 
uh, it's important to note the total scores for the um, for the questionnaire. Um, there was no statistical significantly uh, statistically significant difference between those either. So overall, um, it didn't really show a difference between uh, the fistula plug or the surgeon's preference when it came to fecal incontinence quality of life. All right, let's have a look at some more surgical uh, outcomes. Uh, so uh, some depressing number really in uh, the first uh, few rows uh, concerning clinical fistula healing uh, in both groups, unfortunately. So a significant proportion of patients at 12 months still do have a fistula, uh, more um, than 50%, uh, just about more than 50% uh, had healed. And these numbers are still pretty low uh, at six weeks and six months as well. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is virtually no uh, significant difference between the two groups for any of the secondary outcomes, with the exception of uh, complications at six weeks and um, reinterventions at six weeks, which, as you can see, then disappears throughout the remaining uh, time frame of the trial up to 12 months. Um, so, uh, again, no significant difference between uh, the inner fistula plug and surgeon's preference uh, in these secondary outcomes. Um, Let's have a quick look at the cost analysis results. Now, uh, there's quite a lot of methodology behind this uh, that the authors describe uh, very well. Uh, obviously, for times related reasons, we can't really go into too much details, but suffice to say that there is an additional cost associated with the fiscal plug of about 500 pound, uh, and that they do use the QALY or QALY um, methodology or framework. Uh, to determine whether uh, this fistula plug is uh, cost effective or not. Traditionally, we say that something is in the context of the NHS cost effective if uh, it falls between 20,000 and 30,000 pounds, which is considered to be the cost of dialysis. Uh, and the authors suggest that there is roughly a 45%, 35 to 45% chance of this being the case. However, uh, as you can see, uh, once uh, adjusting quality of life, uh, with the baseline values, uh, this cost could potentially be up to £32,400. So potentially not cost effective in an NHS um, context. And Paul, back to you. So we're just going to go through some limitations of the study. Um, they've reported some themselves. So um, as GA mentioned, there was slow recruitment, which led to uh, lowering of the sample size to 300. He also mentioned that initially they were planning for 500. So they calculated that um, the uh, power needed, so the number needed to have sufficient power to detect small to moderate treatment effects would be 400. And they were going to over um, subscribe the trial in order to sort of offset um, possible poor compliance or losing people to follow up um, but then they weren't able to do that at all um, because of the slow recruitment and just cut it right down to 300. Um, they did say however uh, they wondered if uh, this decrease in sample size um, was actually offset by their good compliance and low rates of um, patients lost to follow up which Joe has just mentioned um, so that's um, a possibility. Um, they've also reported a lack of masking of participants' data uh, collectors or surgeons, which, we, again, we'd already noted, um, which could have led to bias in pretty much any of those directions. Um, again, they um, argued that it would have been really difficult for them to mask any of those things and that it was unlikely to affected, have affected the primary outcome, um, but we can't be sure of that. A few more points here that we picked up uh, reading through the paper. Well, um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, I couldn't really, despite reading this paper a few times, uh, work out how the sample size calculation was conducted. Um, they do mention um, a power they are uh, willing to achieve, but uh, they don't mention any previous literature or what expected a difference uh, there would be in the traditional treatment arm and how that would potentially compare with uh, the experimental group and whether uh, this is based on a non-inferiority concept or a um, different concept. And obviously with uh, the cost of the fistula plug being there, 
uh, a non-inferiority um, sort of uh, calculation would probably not be uh, appropriate. Um, I cannot stress enough, uh, they mentioned it themselves, but the primary outcome here is purely self-reported. And in a context of an open label trial, that does, I think, constitute a limitation because uh, the placebo effect cannot really be ruled out. Um, and again, despite reading the paper a couple of times, I couldn't really work out what the role of the MRI was in this context because uh, it wasn't in inclusion criteria. And we know that 10% of patients in both arms had an MRI that did not demonstrate a transphenteric fistula, another type of fistula. Uh, no time frame is provided concerning uh, original diagnosis uh, and uh, uh, EUA and insertion of Seton or EUA and insertion of Seton and the randomization and intervention that is conducted. Also, it is unclear uh, what the level of the surgeon that made the original diagnosis uh, was, because again, the inclusion criteria are purely clinical uh, here. Um, we couldn't find any information related to whether procedures were changed interoperatively. Uh, so that is to say, a surgeon is approaching um, uh, a patient with a particular plan, then obviously they perform the EUA and they decide to go for a different procedure. Uh, how often that happened is a bit unclear. And no interim analysis is mentioned in um, uh, the methodology. So I'm not sure when they decided that the recruitment was too slow um, and uh, on what basis. Uh, Bob, back to you. OK, so it's just a, a little final conclusion. So uh, this study, um, they have uh, shown no significant difference in fecal incontinence questionnaire or fistula healing at six weeks, six months, um, or 12 months. Um, and to be honest, it does remain unclear um, just how cost effective it is. Um, because as Gio said, um, it could, it, the fistula plug may not be cost effective uh, in an NHS setting. Um, and then this is just a little table to uh, describe some of the good bits and bad bits we've just been over. And here we go again with a quick summary of the discussion we've had about the paper after the presentation. We reiterated a few points uh, that uh, we made during the presentation itself as well as made some fresh ones. It's important to notice uh, concerning this trial that the surgeon's preference arm um, does have a fair amount of heterogeneity. This is true at patient's levels as the treatments that are provided in that arm um, uh, are quite different from each other, but also at surgeon's level, as the uh, treatments themselves are not uh, standardised. The author describes how they use a workshop for uh, instructing surgeons on how to insert the uh, fistula plug, uh, but there is no attempt at standardising uh, alternative uh, surgeon preference treatments. We reiterated again how uh, choosing a patient-reported outcome in the context of an open-level trial um, does potentially increase the risk of bias, as well as re-highlighted some issues associated with the sample size calculations. Um, the uh, level of experience of the different surgeons involved uh, could potentially have affected the results as well. And finally, a, a further relevant point about design. Uh, despite our best effort, we couldn't really work out uh, if the study was designed as a, a superiority, non-inferiority or equivalence trial. And in the presence of a detected potential excess cost associated with the fistula plug, it would be quite important to know what approach was used in the design, as one would argue that the cost of the fistula in itself is a disadvantage of the fistula and would therefore potentially require a superiority approach rather than a non-inferiority or equivalence approach. As usual, we'll be asking some questions to the authors. We keep you posted concerning the outcomes. I will leave you to Prof. Saba lecture now. Thank you. Right, so we have talked about randomized control trials um, in some of our previous talks. And this time, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on um, three uh, randomized control trial designs, superiority, non-inferiority, and equivalence. Okay, so that's what we, uh, we're going to do. I suspect you guys can see my slides. Right, so traditionally, uh, when we think of uh, designing a trial um, or a study for that matter, 
we've tended to start off the null hypothesis and we talk about two-sided testing or um, two-sided tests of significance. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of um, two-tailed tests versus one-tailed tests in this particular talk, uh, but that's what we um, traditionally used to do. But um, it often, uh, you know, sounded not very logical. You know, how do you start off uh, a study uh, saying, or oh, two treatments are the same, and that you're going to do a study to uh, test this hypothesis? That never really made uh, uh, much sense. So more and more, people have started um, reverting back to uh, um, thinking about the research question. So what is a research question? And, um, and uh, which is essentially the question the study is meant to answer. And then use the research question to lead on to what we call the alternative hypothesis or HA which is essentially the hypothesis that is based on the research question. OK, a lot of this will make sense as I go through the slides I've got with an example, but this is what um, is um, uh, done um, currently. So you start off with the research question and then that leads on to formulation of the alternative hypothesis that's based on the research question. And then you uh, write down or you decide on the null hypothesis, which is simply the inverse of the alternative hypothesis. OK, and this uh, is the hypothesis that the study is going to be designed to test. Then you do your study, you collect the data, you analyze your data, and if the data is in keeping with the null hypothesis, then you do not reject the null hypothesis, or you're not able to reject the null hyp hypothesis. And if you note, um, I say don't reject the null hypothesis, I'm not saying accept it, okay, but there's a difference. If the data enables you to refute the null hypothesis, then you accept the alternative hypothesis, okay? You want to keep in mind that any study you design to test a hypothesis, um, you will never be able to prove the hypothesis. You can only get enough evidence to be able to reject the hypothesis, okay? And, and, and that's why um, we... Um, go from the alternative hypothesis to the null hypothesis and then design the study to test the null hypothesis, okay? And um, all we're saying now um, is that instead of starting off with the null hypothesis, you go back to the, to the research question, which is the primary question that the study is meant to answer, work out the alternative hypothesis and then the null hypothesis, okay? If this sounds a little bit complicated, I hope the following slides will make this um, clearer. So essentially, in trials, you want to compare interventions. Okay, that's why we do trials, be it surgical trials or uh, trials on drugs. And you try and answer questions on what would be the optimal treatment strategy, or more simply put, which treatment is better. Okay, so when you say uh, which treatment is better, when you ask the question which treatment is better, there's a couple of things you need to think about. The first is better in what way, or what particular outcome? Now, there are so many different outcomes that uh, you might be interested in. Let's say you're looking at cancer trials. You could be interested in outcomes such as survival. You could be interested in simply reducing recurrence rates, uh, recurrence of cancer, I mean. You could be interested in quality of life of patients. You could be interested in side effects and so on and so forth. And for each of these outcomes, there are many different ways of defining these outcomes. Survival can be defined as disease-free survival, overall survival, uh, recurrence-free survival. It could be two-year survival, five-year survival, 10-year survival, and so on and so forth. So you should be clear at the start of the study that um, this is the particular outcome and this is how I want to define it, okay? Now, one of the problems with trials is that you can only focus on one outcome called the primary outcome uh, in one trial, or most trials just focus on one outcome. And it is around that outcome that the study is designed, and it is based on that one outcome that the study, the sample size calculations are done. You could assess a number of other outcomes, but they'll all be classed as secondary outcomes, and the study um, only looks at those outcomes in a very um, in a limited manner. They are not the focus of the study and the study can only focus on one primary outcome. So keep that in mind. Next thing you want to think about is, once you've decided on an outcome that you're interested in, 
and you want to see if uh, one treatment is better than the other for that particular outcome, you've got to make a decision on how better, to what extent, right? So how much improvement is clinically important? Let's say you're considering a new treatment A and you want to introduce treatment A for the disease uh, that you, you're focusing on and you are thinking of adopting the new treatment after doing a trial, how much improvement you want to see before you say, I'm going to move to treatment A, right? That is referred to as delta, the Greek letter delta. Um, and then you'll come across uh, this in uh, all the textbooks and the tutorials you read on um, randomized controlled um, trial design. That margin is called the effect size. OK, and it's really important to define this delta or the effect size at the start of the study. So if you say survival is the outcome you're interested in, say five years survival, and you're looking at a new treatment for a specific cancer, then you want to say, I want to see at least a 5% or a 10% improvement before I adopt the new treatment in my practice. So that 5% or 10% is what you refer to as delta or the effect size. Right, moving on. I think a lot of uh, things in statistics and research methodology becomes clearer when you discuss a, uh, an example, when you have something concrete in, uh, uh, to talk about. So we're going to consider an example and uh, uh, doing what I do, um, I've picked a thyroid cancer as an example. So this is the thyroid gland and you've got cancer on the right lobe here uh, and these are the parathyroid glands on either side of the thyroid and you've got the trachea in the middle and you've got these green as, uh, ellipsoids that, um, that uh, represent lymph nodes, okay? So if, you, if you're talking about surgery for low-risk thyroid cancer, uh, the standard treatment has, has been for a number of years what we call a total thyroidectomy, where we remove all of the thyroid gland. One alternative treatment, um, uh, which is more radical than a total thyroidectomy, is what we call total thyroidectomy plus prophylactic central neck dissection, which is where you remove not just the thyroid, but also the lymph glands around the thyroid. Uh, another alternative, which is a less radical option, is where we remove just one half of the thyroid that contains the tumor. So here it would be a right hemithyroidectomy. Okay, so this is just an introduction um, to this um, problem in case you're not familiar with thyroid cancer treatments. So keep this in mind as we proceed to further discuss this, um, this issue. Right, so consider a scenario where total thyroidectomy has been standard treatment for thyroid cancer for some time, and it does have a certain recurrence rate, and yeah, you might be as a thyroid cancer scientist uh, or a thyroid cancer surgeon wondering how can we improve um, survival? How do you reduce recurrence rate? So total thyroidectomy plus central neck dissection has been proposed as, as a solution, as I've just um, um, suggested. And if this is a proposed solution and you want to do a trial, then you want to think about what is it you want to um, address as the primary outcome of interest in this trial. And let's say you, uh, you've chosen, chosen disease-free survival, five-year disease-free survival as your primary outcome. And then you have to think about, like I said, what the delta is going to be or what the effect size is going to be. And you might say, well, I'm not going to do a central neck dissection unless I see an improvement in survival of at least 5%. And this might be because you know that central neck dissection increases the mobility of the operation, increases the risk of nerve damage and voice problems, increases, increases the risk of hypoparathyroidism, and therefore you want to see a, a certain improvement before you adopt the new technology. So you're not going to go for half a percent or one percent. Okay, and this is something that is decided by clinicians, this delta, the effect size based on experience, based on previous literature and so on. All right, so the research question here is going to be, is total thyroidectomy plus central neck dissection better than or superior to total thyroidectomy alone? And it has to be better by more than a certain margin, right? So that's going to be the research question. The alternative hypothesis, so remember I said the research question leads on to what we call the alternative hypothesis. So that'll be total thyroidectomy plus central neck dissection is better than total thyroidectomy alone, right? 
And if you're mathematically inclined, you can follow um, what I've presented here um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, as a summary, as a formula. So total thyroidectomy and central link dissection minus total thyroidectomy alone should be more than the effect size, more than 5%. Okay. The null hypothesis is going to be the inverse of the alternative hypothesis. So the central link dissection with total thyroidectomy is the same or inferior to total thyroidectomy. So that'll be a null hypothesis. And then you design the study to test this null hypothesis. Okay. If you're able to uh, collect data that then disproves the null hypothesis, then you fall back uh, to the alternative hypothesis and say, yes, central link dissection is better. Okay. And this um, kind of design um, is what you refer to as the superiority design, where your um, the question is, is this new treatment superior to standard treatment? And, uh, um, and the study that you would do will follow a superiority uh, design. So uh, this is um, a good example for a uh, superiority trial. Let's move on to another kind of research question. Again, we're talking about total thyroidectomy for low risk, low risk thyroid cancer here. And we know that total thyroidectomy has got significant morbidity. And you're wondering whether you can reduce the morbidity without really compromising on the recurrence rates. And a proposed solution is just doing a hemithyroidectomy, right? So let's take this uh, same primary outcome, which is five-year disease-free survival, and then let's think about um, the effect size. And let's say that if you're doing a slightly inferior operation, inferior in the sense it is less radical than a total thyroidectomy, then you don't really want um, a very poor outcome. Uh, you want to um, ensure that hemithyroidectomy might uh, reduce the survival a little bit, but not too much, but at least it will uh, reduce the side effects that you see from a total thyroidectomy, right? So you're making an allowance for a decrease in disease-free survival, and you might say, um, well, I'm happy to uh, allow a reduction in disease-free survival by 2%, and if the difference is less than 2% between a hemi and a total, then I'll be happy to do a hemi because it's associated with much lower side effects. Okay, so you can see that the research question here is different. The research question is whether a hemithyroidectomy is not inferior to total thyroidectomy. That's the research. It shouldn't be inferior by more than 2%, right? So that leads on to your alternative hypothesis, which is hemithyroidectomy is not inferior to total thyroidectomy. And the null hypothesis will be the opposite, which is hemithyroidectomy is similar or superior to total thyroidectomy. And then you go on to design the study and you conduct the trial, get the data, analyze them, and then test the data against the null hypothesis. Okay, so this kind of um, design would be called non-inferiority design. All right, so I hope that makes sense and uh, you guys are still with me. Let's move on to uh, yet another research question. Again, in thyroid cancer, so we'll keep the same clinical scenario um, so you can relate to it. So there are a number of ways of doing total thyroidectomy. Some people have reported on doing robotic total thyroidectomy, where you do uh, where you put the port through the axilla or from behind the ear, you approach the neck and then do a thyroidectomy. And this is primarily, primarily to reduce um, or to avoid neck scars. Some people have reported on transodal thyroidectomy, again, to avoid the neck scar. And let's assume that um, you are in the early phase of your career as a consultant, you want to um, do the best you can for your patients, and you're interested in adopting one of these two strategies. And um, you have read about, and there's evidence that both of these approaches are equivalent to transcervical or the standard total thyroidectomy. And you, you're asking the question, are the robotic and the transoral approaches equivalent to each other in terms of survival? in thyroid cancer surgery. Okay, so that's your question. Let's assume that the primary outcome of interest is the same, which is five-year disease free survival. And then let's think about the effect size. And um, let's say 1% is the allowance that you're happy to make, and uh, you don't want a uh, robotic or transoral thyroidectomy to be very different from each other in terms of outcomes. 
and, and then the question really then is, are these approaches equivalent or similar? Or if they're dissimilar, they should not be dissimilar by more than delta or 1%. Okay, obviously, if they're dissimilar to a great extent, then you're going to go with uh, the uh, uh, better of the two um, treatments. Right, so the alternative hypothesis here is that robotic total thyroidectomy is the same as total, right? And the null hypothesis is that robotic total is either inferior to or superior to transodal because the null hypothesis has got to be the inverse of the alternative hypothesis. All right, so this is uh, uh, the kind of design that is referred to as equivalence design or equivalence trial. Okay, so these are the three common uh, types of uh, designs in randomized control trials, the superiority trial, the non-inferiority trial, and the equivalence trial. And I hope I've uh, shown you um, some examples where these three approaches are uh, used. Now, um, to somebody that is uh, new to these, um, these, kind of, these kinds of concepts, you immediately want, probably wonder, what about the inferiority trial? Well, the inferiority trial is just the opposite of the superiority trial. But it won't make sense. You're not going to have a clinical question. We're going to ask, oh, is this treatment inferior to standard treatment? There's no, there's no reason you do a trial to, to test that, right? So that's why we don't do inferiority trials. Similarly, you're not going to ask a question uh, that would lend itself to a non-superiority trial. So that's out as well. And you're certainly not going to ask a question where you're going to say, are these two treatments different to each other? Okay. So the inequality trial is out of question. So although these are statistically possible, the inferiority trial, the non-superiority trial, and the inequality trial, they won't make clinical sense. And therefore, we're just left with these three types of clinical trials, the superiority, the non-inferiority, and the equivalence trial. Okay. Now, if you think about it um, carefully, if you go back and look at what I've said in the last few slides, you'll realize that the equivalence trial is equivalent to doing two non-inferiority trials, okay? So you just have to go back to the slides and have a little think about the null and the alternative hypothesis in the non-inferiority and the equivalence trial, and you'll realize and you'll come to this conclusion. All right. Now, here's a table that summarizes what we've talked um, uh, about so far, and we'll, we'll take this one step further. So let's just consider two treatments, A and B. So let's just say B is standard treatment and A is a new treatment that you're interested in. Okay. Now, if you're doing a superiority trial, then the research question is going to be, is A better than B? Is the new treatment better than the standard? If you're doing a non-inferiority trial, then the question is going to be, is A not inferior to B? And if A is not inferior, but has very few side effects or, or is very cost effective, then you might be happy to use A. Okay. And if you're thinking of an equivalence trial, then the research question um, ought to be, are A and B similar? All right. From the research question, you then move on to the alternative hypothesis, because the alternative hypothesis should reflect your research question. All right. So the alternative hypothesis for the superiority trial is A minus B has to be more than the effect size that you're interested in. And the, in the non-inferiority trial, A can be less than B, but just by a certain amount. It can't be very inferior. If it's very inferior, you're, not, you're going to dismiss it. You're not going to be interested. Okay. And in the equivalence trial, the difference between A and B has to be within a certain amount. Right. It could be that A is slightly better or B is slightly better, uh, but not hugely different. Okay. And that uh, is determined by the effect size. Now, the null hypothesis then is the exact opposite of the alternative hypothesis. I'll leave you to um, have a think about this. I'm not going to read what's on the uh, what's on the screen. Now, if you're thinking of um, statistical testing, then uh, you 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 talk about one tail tests and two tail tests. Now, based on what we've just said. The superiority and the non-inferiority trials are one-tail tests, and they are unidirectional. You're thinking of one being 
better than the other, you're not considering that they could be similar, right? So you're going to be uh, employing what we call one tail tests. But if you're thinking of doing an equivalence trial, then uh, you do two tail tests of significance, okay? And um, maybe another day we'll talk about one tailed and two tailed tests of significance and so on. But for the moment, um, I I'm going to leave it uh, at that. Right. So I've got um, two or three figures, which I hope will just explain this um, in a more uh, detailed manner and hope this will make sense. So we're talking of superiority trials now. So um, let's say that um, you, you're looking at the difference between new treatment and the standard treatment. And let's say that this is, this is a vertical line where there is uh, where the difference between the new and the standard treatment is zero, right? So which means there's virtually no difference. And you're designing a superiority trial and uh, you've got the effect size of delta, which means you're looking uh, to see if the new treatment is better than the old uh, by at least delta or more than delta, okay? And let's say you've done the trial and you've got some results and the, the results are summarized here. The mean difference is the middle of this star, okay? The mean difference between the new treatment and the old treatment. And the confidence intervals are um, represented by this line around the star, okay? Now, if you look at this confidence interval, the lower limit of the confidence interval is more than delta, which means that the new treatment is significantly better than the old treatment, okay? And therefore, you've established superiority. Right. On the other hand, you've got the mean difference just about zero, so it is still positive, but the confidence intervals overlap zero, which means that it is uh, it hasn't reached statistical significance. Then you've got to say that superiority is not established. Okay. It doesn't mean that A and B are similar. All it means is that A is not better than B. All right. So just because you have uh, not established superiority does not mean that the treatments are similar um, or equivalent. Let's move on to non-inferiority trial. Again, you've got this uh, vertical line in between um, in, in the middle of this picture, which represents uh, the line where there's no difference between the new treatment and the standard treatment. And if you're doing a non-inferiority trial, um, you are testing a new treatment which you think might be a bit inferior, but probably not too inferior. And if that is the case, you might employ it because it's probably free of side effects or it's very cheap, right? Let's see what um, the results that you've, um, you've got. So you've got um, the results here, which show that the difference between the new and standard treatment is very close to zero. And the confidence intervals uh, are, are shown by this line around the star. And you can see that the lower limit of the confidence interval is more than minus delta. Okay, so it is not overlapping the minus delta line, which is your effect size. Therefore, you can say that you've established non inferiority or that the new treatment is not inferior to the old treatment because it is not uh, overlapping the minus delta line. If, on the other hand, you have, um, you have the results that are represented by this particular uh, uh, line. So you've got the confidence intervals overlapping the minus delta, which means that you have not established non-inferiority. Okay, so uh, this means that um, uh, your null hypothesis is uh, not rejected. Okay. Then we go on to equivalence trials. In equivalence trials, you might remember that we said that we are uh, asking the question, are these two treatments similar? So if uh, they are not similar, um, are they dissimilar by more than delta? That's the question posed in a slightly different way. So if you've got a result like this, where um, the mean difference is virtually equal to zero and the confidence intervals on both sides do not overlap the minus delta or the plus delta line, then you can say that equivalence is established. If, on the other hand, you have uh, confidence intervals overlapping the minus delta line or the plus delta line, then you've got to say equivalence is not established. We haven't got a significant result. We cannot reject the null hypothesis, right? And therefore, we have um, uh, accept the alternative um, hypothesis established. All right.
So, and what you've got to keep in mind is that we are generally moving away from the statistical two-sided testing, which often isn't clinical, um, clinically relevant, to the more clinically useful one-sided testing, right? And in that you're asking the question as to whether this new treatment is better than the old treatment, right? And so that's a clinically useful um, question you want to answer. Or you might ask, ask the question, is the new treatment uh, almost as good as, I don't mind it being a little bit inferior, but it shouldn't be too inferior, okay? Now, if you're doing a superiority trial where you're looking at a new treatment potentially being better than the old treatment, but then you get a negative result, keep in mind that it doesn't mean that these two treatments are the same. Right. Um, we've talked about intention to treat and per protocol analysis in one of our previous talks on randomized controlled trials. And uh, um, I suspect uh, if you have listened to that talk, you probably remember that ideally in a randomized controlled trial, you should report on both these types of analysis. This is important in non-inferiority and equivalence trials. That's something um, uh, to, bet, to bear in mind. Right. So, in common practice, we find lots of surgical trials being superiority trials, okay? But increasingly in the literature, we are looking at trials being reported in the big journals, in surgical journals, that are non-inferiority and equal equivalence trials. And they just aim to answer slightly different questions about the new treatments that are being investigated. So, the non-inferiority will ask the uh, question, are they nearly as good? We're not expecting it to be better. And the hemithyroidectomy, total thyroidectomy is a really uh, good example to keep in mind. So if you're proposing hemithyroidectomy as treatment for thyroid cancer, you're accepting that the hemi is not going to be as good as total, but because the total has got lots of side effects, uh, we're saying, is it nearly as good as total? And if it's nearly as good as total, We'll do, to, uh, we'll do a hemithyroidectomy any day. So that's the kind of question a non-inferiority trial is on asking. Equivalence trial, um, uh, you don't see much of this in surgical research, uh, essentially asking, are these two treatments similar? Okay. And uh, finally, I wanted to emphasize that it's really important to start with the research question when you're deciding on the trial design. Then you formulate your alternative hypothesis and the inverse of the alternative hypothesis, which will be your null hypothesis. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.